A high route is something I've been interested in since I first heard about them, probably at some point in between through hiking the Pacific Crest Trail and Continental Divide Trail. Just the next thing in the ever-expanding and sometimes overwhelming list of outdoor hobbies I'd like to try. But getting the confidence to actually embark on one has been a different story. Leaving for the Fifner Traverse, I was a huge bundle of nerves, constantly questioning my abilities and unsure it was wise for me to even attempt something that I began to believe was too far outside of my skill set. Being afraid is something I've learned to embrace, but each time I do something new that truly scares me, it feels like I'm learning that lesson all over again. The fear never really goes away when I'm truly trying to expand the edge of my comfort zone. Sometimes when the imposter syndrome takes over and the fear feels inescapable, the only way to get it done is to just commit and force yourself to figure it out. And that's how, on August 7th, I found myself departing for the Fifner Traverse. My friend Leslie agreed to join me, and the Fifner Traverse would be her first high route as well. She bussed up from Denver, and the next morning, we were dropping my car at Berthed Pass, our endpoint. My fiance, Josh, drove us to Rocky Mountain National Park, where we picked up our permits, and finally, he dropped us off at Milner Pass, the northern terminus of this north to south high route. We are about to officially start. Went to the bathroom, got dropped off on the divide. It's go time. How are you feeling? Great, 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 great. At around 10 a.m., we were finally hiking. After all the nerves leading up to this trip, the immediate climb from the Milner Pass parking lot felt surprisingly relieving, but that feeling didn't last long. Skies had been gray since we entered the park and we're only getting darker as we approach treeline. A laminate sign at our first trail junction warned hikers to turn around if the sky is at all overcast and went on to emphasize that lightning is deadly. It felt too soon to give up, so Leslie and I decided to push on to treeline in a futile effort to just see what the clouds would do. The clouds did not magically disappear when we reached the last cluster of trees and we decided to hunker down between them while we figured out what to do next. With seven miles of exposed and off-trail challenges before us, we began to reluctantly realize a lower route might be the smartest option for today. Just then, a couple we'd seen going up and was coming back down ended up offering us a ride to a lower trailhead. It solidified our decision, and as soon as we started hiking back down with them, the skies opened up. It rained and hailed as we made our way back to their car, and although this was not the way we wanted to start this adventure, it definitely seemed like we made the right move. The sweet couple took us to the Green Mountain Trailhead, and we ended up hiking a portion of the CDT I'd missed last year to get to our first night's campsite. The walk to our site was through a large burn area due to the East Troublesome Fire, but the regrowth was beautiful, and there were berries everywhere. Yum. Hail and thunder broke up the sunny skies, further validating our decision to take the low route for the day. Oh my gosh, what a first day. <laughs> it's not that big. It has not been 30 <laughs> seconds. I should have just left the recording and just the sun came out. There's still thunder in the distance. When we finally got to camp, I had just pitched my tent when it started to hail. The hail lasted a lot longer than either of us expected. And it got worse before it got better. When it did eventually stop, we cooked dinner before turning in for the night and prepared for the six long days still ahead. Fifner day one, if you can even call it that, is done. Um, we had to bail off of the ridge today up to Mount Ida. Um, we never even really made it up there. And yeah, we just took a low route instead of being high on the divide. Um, not even like the official Fifner alternate because that still went over Hanok Pass and it's a good thing we didn't because it was thundering and hailing pretty bad um, for a while this afternoon as well. Um, so just typical Colorado things. We're gonna wake up super early tomorrow. 
um, feeling optimistic about our day and we'll go over Ptarmigan Pass, which is on the CDT, which I never actually did when I was on the CDT, so I am excited to fill in this little gap. We woke up early, knowing the first seven miles of our day would be above treeline and exposed, and that monsoon season was certainly upon us. However, we still got a slower than expected start to our day when three bull moose entered camp and didn't seem to care at all that we were there. First, they were in the trees next to camp, but soon they were walking right through the middle and we were forced to abandon our packs and put some protective trees between us and the moose. We watched as they made themselves at home, rubbing antlers and sniffing my backpack. I think one might have even stepped on my hip belt and broke off just a small piece of plastic. Luckily, it was still usable. Eventually, they wandered farther back into the woods on the other side of camp, and we were free to grab our packs and leave. Not long after we rejoined the CDT, we ran into a cow and a cat. Potentially the reason the bull moose were coming that way in the first place. We gave the mom and baby a wide berth and continued on with our morning hike. From there, we began a long climb to Ptarmigan Pass and were greeted by another high alpine warning sign. I tried to remain thankful for doing this climb on a trail, knowing that would not be the case for many of the climbs in our near future. The morning above treeline began beautifully, and I even came across some ptarmigans. How appropriate. Bighorn Flats was long and exposed, and I was grateful for blue skies. The wind picked up as we approached Ptarmigan Pass, and we picked up our pace to get out of the cold. It's about 9.30, and I'm about a mile from Ptarmigan Pass. We got a little held up this morning by several moose encounters. Back there looks a little sus, just like some clouds forming but up ahead where we're going looks fine. Um, and we should be able to get below tree line before noon, so I'm feeling pretty optimistic about the high altitude stuff today. We saw our descent in the distance and it appeared deceivingly close. It took what felt like forever to get back down to trees, but they did provide some relief from the wind. We stopped for lunch and took our time, realizing we would probably be arriving to camp before 1 p.m. We briefly debated whether it was worth it to camp illegally so we could tackle a 1400 foot climb today instead of tomorrow. Our curiosity about the idea was quickly stifled when we ran into a ranger and I was reminded that I like to follow the rules. He checked our permits and we asked him about tomorrow's weather, which he said was supposed to be good. After getting to camp, we set up and I promptly took a nice long nap. We ate dinner on the cliff overlooking the creek that flowed by our campsite, and I filtered all the water I would need for tonight and the next morning. Leslie and I pulled out our maps and went over tomorrow's plan. A daunting day with 13 miles, 5,000 plus feet of gain, and almost completely off-trail travel. All right, Fifner, day two. We were actually on the route today. It's about 7 p.m., and we're already turning in. We got to our campsite at like probably like 1.30, 2 p.m. It's like the only campsite that really makes sense. It's the farthest south on the route without exiting the park. And it makes for a really gnarly day tomorrow, like 13 miles and like 6,000 feet of gain. Um, but there's not really anywhere else that makes sense without camping illegally. So um, that's where we are and we're Gonna have a lot of actual route finding tomorrow. We've been on trail up until now just because of our reroute that we had to do at the beginning. Um, and yeah, we're gonna be in for a day. We're gonna wake up at like 4.30 to get started and hopefully be moving by like 5.30. We got a 5.40 start this morning. And it was nice and warm last night. So feeling good about today. Starting off with a 1400 foot climb. We were moving before the sun was up and starting the climb to Lake Nikita and Lake Nakoni. Luckily, this climb was well switched back and it went by quickly. The lakes were gorgeous and I only wished we had more time to spend at them. We did have our second breakfast at Lake Nanita and tried to stay warm on the shore. We didn't stop for long, knowing our real off trail travel was about to begin. I was starting to feel less apprehensive and more excited. We followed a creek for some time before starting up a steep, rocky, and grassy slope that, looking back, very much feels like the precursor of everything that lay ahead. Once up that slope, we could see our first true milestone, Beak Pass. Just ahead, 
I believe that saddle is Beak Pass, which is our first pass of the day. And holy crap, this is just incredibly gorgeous. Wow. We just crossed this giant talus field because we sort of went the wrong way, but that's okay. This is Catherine Lake. Beautiful. Probably sees humans like twice a year. And then we're following that like grassy ramp looking thing up to the pass. After crossing the talus field, only tundra and vertical feet lay between us and the top of the pass. Once at the top of our first off-trail pass, self-doubt that had been nagging me since I started planning this trip began to really fade. For the first time, I started to think, maybe I really can do this. We came from that dip over there between those rocks, like right there, and through all that, and now, So we are headed for Isolation Peak Pass, about there. The challenge of this route did not just lay in the brutal ascents, but also in the forested descents. Steep terrain littered with beetle-killed tree blowdowns made for slow progress, but the excitement of being off trail and successfully navigating our way to our next landmark, Spirit Lake, was enough to keep spirits high. Wow! <laughs> That's funny! After all, we didn't really come out here for an easy walk in the woods. At Spirit Lake, we joined an unmaintained trail that was also littered with blowdowns, but far fewer than the descent we had just come from. At Fourth Lake, we decided to stop for lunch and a break before our next big ascent, Isolation Peak Pass. We were joined by tons of brook trout eating top water and swimming next to shore. They were surprisingly not our only company, and we actually met another hiker taking on the Fifner Traverse. From Fourth Lake, we left the unmaintained trail and began to follow a sporadic use trail to Fifth Lake. Again, we were surprised to see several people, including a ranger. He relayed tales of his own single push Fifner attempt, a good reminder that no matter how far you take something in the outdoors, there's always going to be someone doing something more intense than you. We skirted the lake and began another brutally steep ascent. I thought about all the times I've reached an alpine lake and never even thought about going beyond it, especially without a trail, and all the possibilities that now felt within reach. That is where we're headed, that little saddle up ahead. Oh, that was a hell of an ascent. Any thoughts? <laughs> the route flattened out some before the final push and the wind whipped relentlessly on top of the pass. The top of Isolation Peak Pass was not only our second big objective for the day, but also the entry point to Paradise Park, a pristine area of Rocky Mountain with no road or trail access. It was also the beginning of another forested descent, though this one proved to be less steep and dense than the last. We followed periodic elk trails to a meadow at the low point of the valley before following a creek toward our final and most foreboding objective, Paradise Pass. First view of Paradise Pass that obvious dip. Andrew Skirka, whose guide we used for this route, describes this pass as looking unrealistically steep. And I tend to agree. It didn't help that we'd already climbed 4,500 feet and descended more than 3,000, most of which was without a trail. And not only did the pass look unrealistically steep, at times it also felt that way. Both Leslie and I later discussed having moments where we didn't feel like we could keep moving up, but were forced to out of fear of falling backwards. But we followed eroded elk trails and eventually made it to the top and the official border of Rocky Mountain National Park. On the other side lay Indian Peaks Wilderness in our camp for the night. On our descent, we scoped out Cooper Peak Pass, the next morning's objective. And if Paradise Pass looked unrealistically steep, this looked to be impossibly steep. But the guidebook barely noted it, and the ranger we met at camp didn't seem to skip a beat when we mentioned it being our exit route, which restored some of our confidence in ourselves. As we approached the base of Cooper Peak Pass the next morning, it looked much less menacing than the night before. While a gain of 1,100 feet in less than half a mile was very much still our reality, something about wildflowers in the morning light and the previous day's success made it feel almost dreamy. Almost. 
We grinded up the ascent, putting one foot in front of the other in a meditative state, trying not to think about how tired my legs felt or how often I had to stop to catch my breath. As the sun came up, it illuminated the Gore Range in the distance, my home range, and something about being able to see my house from here gave me the boost I needed to conquer the rest of the climb. The tundra turned to loose scree, but I was eventually able to find solid rock and then the top of the pass. The descent proved to be much more challenging, and Leslie and I used different methods for tackling the loose, steep scree. I let thousands of tiny rocks slide beneath me, almost shoe skiing, but much, much slower. Leslie down climbed some solid rock while I watched from below, keeping enough distance that a loose rock wouldn't mean my demise. We took a break, taking in the beauty of this seldom visited basin, before skirting around the gorgeous island lake. The guidebook mentioned staying higher in elevation, above lakeside cliffs, which we did semi-successfully, only momentarily thwarted by some <laughs> thick crumb holds. Try stepping on top of it if you can. That helped me. We continued our descent and admired all the places we were getting to see, and may never have seen, had we not ventured off trail. We took a break at Gord Lake and discussed whether or not we felt comfortable on Paiute Pass, one of the two most technical features on the route. While we felt good about what we'd done so far, this was both of our first high routes, and it felt like the smarter decision to bypass the more technical features until we had more experience. We had already kind of called it on Paiute in Northeast Gully, but now, Check out the sky, that's it, like right behind me. I'm not gonna point it out, you're not gonna be able to tell, but whew, seems like the weather is confirming our decision. <laughs> As the weather cleared up, my stomach turned stormy and we had to decide whether we'd make it to our permitted site. Luckily, some Pepto set me right and we climbed the four miles to camp, knowing we'd have to descend the same miles in the morning as part of a 24 mile day. The campsite was perfect for the primary route, but not so perfect for bypassing the two most technical features. However, the trail to the site was lovely and we did not regret getting to camp in and see Lone Eagle Cirque. Plus, it gave us a chance to check out Northeast Gully for ourselves, the most technical feature on the entire route. We were pretty sure we would root around it, but it's always nice to at least see for yourself. The gully did indeed look menacing, not to mention filled with snow from below. Although, if there's one thing I did learn on this route, it's that it's hard to really gauge until you're up close. I'm sure I will be back for Northeast Gully one day. We left camp early, pausing to admire the stunning still reflections in the morning light. With 24 miles and 5,000 feet of gain ahead of us, we knew we were in for quite the day. We were routing around Northeast Gully as well as the Devil's Thumb Fire, which meant our whole day was on trail, but much longer than originally anticipated. Another moose sighting and the discovery of ripe thimbleberries made for an exciting morning, and descending the four miles we ascended the day before actually wasn't so bad. We crossed paths with tons of day hikers before making our way to the Arapaho Pass Trail, which was somehow completely empty for our 10 mile ascent, save a few backpackers in Coyote Park. We paralleled the creek for most of the morning and enjoyed a long, slow climb, a stark contrast to most climbs on the Fifner Traverse. Check out these huge moose prints. That's a big old moose. It is Fifner day five. Started early this morning. We rerouted around Paiute yesterday, but still went up to Crater Lake, even though we were pretty sure we were gonna reroute around Northeast Gully, which we kind of added like eight unnecessary miles for ourselves, but Crater Lake was beautiful. That's where our permits were. And we did get to look at Northeast Gully and confirm that we didn't feel comfortable doing it. Um, so today we did the Cascade Creek Trail back down to the Arapaho Pass Trail. And we've been doing that all morning. We're probably about 13 miles in, have like nine more. Got like 2,000 more feet up this pass. And then we'll have some more ups and downs after that, but not quite as bad. This has been a really long, steady climb, which honestly doesn't feel like bad at all after some of the stuff we've done on this high route. So it's kind of nice to have that perspective. We rejoined the primary route where trees started to thin and climbed Arapaho Pass with dark clouds snipping at our heels. What do we think? Will I get stormed on? Or not? The ascent was nicely switchbacked and beautiful, and it made me sad to know we'd be routing below treeline again. 
At the top, we scoped out the route we would have taken toward Caribou Pass, Cabin Pass, and Devil's Thumb Pass, and instead began our descent. I have a feeling I'll be back for that section too. As we descended, the clouds behind us grew darker, and part of me was a little relieved we didn't have several more hours of exposed hiking. We stopped to check out 4th of July Mine and started to encounter large swaths of people. This lasted until we passed Diamond Lake, where we had a lovely encounter with a young bull elk. Beyond there, trail conditions declined, but the views did not. We even spotted an entire elk herd on our way to our permitted spot at Jasper Lake. It felt like we were being rewarded for our reroutes with incredible wildlife. We got to camp as the sun was setting, greeted by three deer in a meadow. Exhausted, we set up camp and prepared for another day above treeline. Luckily, day six was shorter and all on trail to put us in a good spot for our final day on the James Peak skyline. The weather wasn't supposed to be bad until 4 p.m., so we allowed ourselves to sleep in until 5.30. We immediately began our 2,000-foot climb back up to the divide at Devil's Thumb Pass, where we would rejoin the primary route once again. The abundance of trail runners was a clear indication of Saturday in the front range, and we allowed them all to pass as we struggled toward a milestone of 20,000 feet of cumulative gain. It's Fifner day six. Probably won't be able to hear me because of the wind. Um, but it's cloudy and it's cold today. Hopefully we get down from the divide before thunder. The more time I spend in the mountains, the less I find myself stressed about just any clouds and more focused on ones that appear afternoon. But I'd be lying if I said gray skies don't always cause me at least a little bit of anxiety. With gray skies looming overhead, we did continue the climb to Devil Sun Pass, where we would gain the divide and stay on it for basically the rest of the day. After our off-trail travel, it was easier to reframe the on-trail ascents, and before long, we were at the top. 360-degree views tend to quickly erase any discomfort caused by a long climb. Annoyingly, when we reached the junction with the trail that is closed from the Devil Sun Fire, we saw no signage. That, combined with most people we talked to not even knowing there were fire closures, made us feel a little bit like our reroute may have been unnecessary. At Rollins Pass, we left the Indian Peaks Wilderness and entered the James Peak Protection Area. We passed a huge trail crew doing work at the pass before regaining the divide once again. I remembered this section from my time on the CDT. The trail was basically non-existent, and it really frustrated me last year, so it was interesting to know how little it bothered me now, and how much my perspective had changed over the last few days. We peered over the east side of the divide to glacial lakes, some of which still held snow. And the skies did what Colorado summer skies do, continued to fill with clouds. We picked up the pace as the gray of the sky got darker, and eventually reached our junction for camp. Due to the lack of water and sheltered spots in the divide, we'd be descending about 800 feet to Rogers Pass Lake for the evening. We scoped out a spot from above and made it to one just before the rain started. We were grateful to have some shelter in the trees, but apprehensive of how we'd go to the bathroom with so many people around. We napped, cooked dinner, filtered water, and checked the weather for our last day on the Fifth Nurture Traverse. The forecast for our day seven would be very important since the James Peak skyline traverses five 13,000 foot peaks, is completely exposed, and past James Peak offers no real bailout options. We found that there was a chance of rain on our last peak starting around 1 p.m., which in Colorado can mean anything from a totally innocuous day above treeline to a 100% chance of scary weather by noon. With that in mind, we decided on our earliest wake up time yet, 3.45 a.m. Our final day on the Fifner Traverse began before the sun came up. When I have the motivation to wake up that early, aka afternoon storms, walking through sunrise is one of my favorite parts of backpacking. Most of our climbing for the day was in the first few miles. We had 2,500 feet to climb from camp to James Peak and we knew it would be a slog. But what really ended up slowing us down was turning around every couple minutes to watch the morning light spread across the divide. It was one of those mornings that reminds you why you do the things you do. Why you put yourself through seven days of physical exertion and uncomfortable situations. It's all for moments like these. Moments that far too few people ever get to experience. At the top of James, clouds were rolling in on the east side of the divide, and being above them made for a heavenly scene at 13,294 feet. We didn't stay to watch them for long though, because it was 7.30 and we had four more 13ers to climb and several miles to go before treeline. 
Between James and the next peak, Bancroft, was a small call with some class two scrambling. We downclimbed some big rocks overlooking a beautiful lake and both agreed this was probably the most fun we'd had on the route so far. Just spicy enough to be fun, not so spicy it was scary. Eventually the talus turned to tundra and we ascended several hundred feet to the peak of Mount Bancroft. As we did, the clouds that were in the distance while we were on James Peak began to roll on to the divide. The call we crossed to get there became completely enveloped and I worried the same would happen to us. I waited for Leslie on the saddle between Bancroft and Perry, afraid that if we were too far apart, we would soon lose visibility of each other. I was pretty sure we'd be able to navigate, but wasn't sure how cold or wet things would get in a massive cloud. Luckily, the divide seemed to stop the clouds in their tracks. As we climbed up to Perry, the clouds stopped about 25 yards from the ridge we were walking on. At the top, we saw them spilling over the ridges we'd already crossed and stopped at the ridges we were approaching. A dad and daughter through hiking duo on top of Perry further reassured us. When other experienced hikers aren't panicking, it helps me not to panic. I did a quick jaunt to Mount Eva, and while I admired the clouds from before, the ones above Flora started to scare me again. Now there were gray clouds above us, not just the white ones rolling in from the east, and the peak of Flora was fully out of sight, but the only way out now was through. And as we climbed, the fear lessened. I reminded myself that since it was still a while before noon, the worst that could probably happen is rain, and I know how to hike in rain. We made it to the peak of Flora and officially finished all the climbing on the Fifner Traverse. All that was left now was the descent. Leslie and I basically jogged down Flora, partially due to the cold, partially due to our excitement to be finished, and partially due to the pit toilets awaiting us at Berthed Pass. As I approached my car that we'd dropped off seven days prior, I reflected on how different I felt about this trip since I'd left it there. I went from feeling anxious and overwhelmed to excited and confident. My passion for backpacking was reignited in a way it hadn't been in a long time. I felt refreshed and ready for whatever the next adventure would be. After I got a hot shower and a hot meal, of course. <laughs>